<laughs> Welcome to the A discussion for Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. The eighth A discussion. I don't think it's the eighth it at is. all. Okay, cool. Yeah. Welcome back to episode 491. We didn't, we haven't decided. On what? What are you looking for? <laughs> <laughs> what do you want? I have, we haven't decided on who's Dr. Jekyll and who's Mr. Hyde. In this little, yeah. th- with you and me? Yeah. Okay, I don't think you know how Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde who's, works. Who's going to drink and smoke and fuck? <laughs> I, but I do the drinking and the smoking and you take care of whatever that last thing was uh, uh, my can we fight in the club yeah okay I think you're Hyde then in that case you're fighting in the club I'm just imagining now that song sung by um, by uh, Sid from uh, from Jack 2 my can we fight in the club <laughs> I mixed we, up that vodka yeah. and that chronic we mix that vodka with that chronic and we feel that love that's Vin oh <laughs> Oh, you said Sid. Oh my God! I always... It's the same mistake. Three you made. letter names. <laughs> it's it's the same as people with last name or first names for last names. Mm. You can never trust them, and you can never get it straight either. Yeah. I knew this guy. Either his name was David Carl or Carl David. I couldn't tell you. Mm. Oscar Isaac. Yeah, Isaac Oscar. That guy. Is it Isaac Oscar? I have no idea. No, it's Oscar Isaac. I, really? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Because I I always get it backwards. So yeah, that makes that makes more sense. Brad Pitt. What? That'd be such a shit name. This is my son, Pitt. Pitt's an angel from Brawl. That's the only thing I know it from. An angel? Yeah, he's like an angel. He's he's probably from some game. Wow. Uh, But yeah, he's got this like spinny wheel. He's not cool. Anyway, so we're here for, we're here to talk about a book. Yeah. So Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. I don't, yeah, I guess it's a short story. It's a 70 page novel. Strange tale. It is a strange tale. It certainly is. So the story actually takes place similar to uh, Frankenstein, where it's not actually from the perspective of who you would consider the main character. Mm. So it's from the perspective of a lawyer named Mr. Utterson. Mm. And uh, Mr- I like that name. <laughs> Mr. Utterson. <laughs> Mr. Utterson. <laughs> so he's a lawyer who, quote unquote, defends going down men. Oh. Which, so he's a defense lawyer. Interesting. So most of the people he rubs shoulders with or have done crimes. He spends his time going down on men well, who no. are going down. See, they are going down men, so wouldn't they be going down on him? Wouldn't that make more sense? Sure. Yeah. That's how he that's his payment. Yeah. For those who can't pay for it. And he says They young, didn't have public defenders back then. Says, that's how you had to get a lawyer. Young man, pick yourself off the ground. I said young man. There's no need to feel down. <laughs> young man. I said, young man, <laughs> do you want to be my client? <laughs> it's time to play Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyatt. <laughs> so Utterson never, never judges the men that he defends. He tries to be really, uh, I don't even know what to call it, uh, removed, I guess, from the situation. Okay. There's a word for it that I'm totally missing. And Unbiased? It's... Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Non-prejudice, bi- I guess. Partisan? Bipartisan? See, I was going to say partisan, but I didn't know if that worked. So, yeah, whatever. He tries to not be... the intelligence? He likes to not judge people. Community? So, what are Utterson called, is going... Way? What? They call, like, A viewers? Yeah. Discussion viewers? Yeah, because each viewer is a viewer, so they could be the A viewers. No, the no. A, no, the A discussion viewers. Yes, I like that. I like, I like <laughs> that how, flows. I like how it doesn't rolls off sound the tongue. like a name. <laughs> it's just like a matter of fact. <laughs> it's like when you see something whose scientific name and it's act and it's like spoken name are the same. Mm. So it's just written and then written underneath and then written underneath again. Mm. So Mr. Utterson goes for a walk with a, na- a man named Mr. Enfield, who's not hugely important to the story, but they go for a weekly walk. Is he the fl- framing device? Uh, he's how the whole thing starts. So they go for this walk, uh, on a weekly basis, no matter what. So for two super busy men, they still somehow find time to do this, like, leisurely stroll. To go down on each other. To go down on, yeah, to go down the by streets and then go down on each other. Mm, nice. That's, that's The by streets, yes. Yeah. So they're walking through this, this neighborhood and they see this odd door. And, <laughs> yeah. So that's how it all starts. It starts with a lonely door, but... The reason it's weird is that this street is filled with vendors and homes and you see children running around, but then this one door never opens. No one goes in it, no one seems to come out of it, and it just kind of sits there dormant. Okay. Dormant. Yeah. It's a door. (laughs) (laughs) And it's sitting dormant. (laughs) I see. (laughs) So they come to this 
They come to this door, and Enfield remembers a weird story relating to this door that he tells Utterson. This is like, dude, if my friend talked this much about doors, I just <laughs> fucking keep going. It'd be hard to make pace with me. Don't forget, these people live in... Oh, yeah, that's actually one of the cool oh, things yeah. about this story. It's in 18-something. It literally writes in... Every time it tells you what the date is, it'll say June 9th, 18, and then it has two underlines. Oh. So it's in, it's very obviously in the 1800s, but it is vague about when specifically. That's kind of cool. I do think that's kind of cool because it, it dates it, but not too harshly. Huh. So he's telling this boring-ass story about a stupid door, and <laughs> he s- remembers that he was there one night um, on a... Oop, careful with the sorry, door. people. Careful with that fucking sorry, table. Pe- you said careful with the door. Table! <laughs> <laughs> you, did. you totally did. Get your hand off the table! <laughs> So he saw this man walking down the street and a girl walking on a on a perpendicular street, mm. and they were about to collide at the corner. And I guess back in London, you just watched. You didn't try and tell them. People still do that now. Cause yeah. They film it. Yeah, exactly. Whoop out their phone. He, imagine him sketching it. This <laughs> man just clobbering this woman. <laughs> so when they interact, when they hit each other, the man just tramples right over the girl, just knocks her to the ground, basically steps on her, walks straight past her as if she wasn't there. Wow. She's not injured, but she's quite flustered. So Enfield just runs up after this dude, captures him, and brings him back to the girl to, you know, for justice. (laughs) This is what London's all about, (laughs) justice. So he drags the man back there, and the girl is surrounded by her family now, and they're all pissed. So he describes this man as a juggernaut. Okay. Meaning meaning in the way he behaves. He's just, he's a brute all the time. He's super rude. So they managed to get him to pay 100 pounds, which 100 pounds nowadays is $160 Canadian. Oh. So it's a substantial, I mean, it's a reasonable chunk of change today. So imagine how much that was in the 1800s. Right. 100 pounds, a lot of money. So that's what they were demanding from him. So he takes them to that door goes inside, and when he comes back out, he has a check signed in another man's name. He has a check signed in the name of Dr. Jekyll. Oh. But this man knows who Dr. Jekyll is, so it's clearly not him. But in the morning, the check cashes, and everything works out fine, so he doesn't think about it again until this very moment when he tells this story. How did checks work back then? Uh, they would ve- they would actually verify the signature. They would have somebody look at your signature and look at it beside the check to determine if it was accurate. But, so then they would, like, they would know your account and go and take the money out of your... Yeah, oh yeah. They just take the money out physically well, and move anything it over. they do on the computer now, they just did in the <clears throat> ledger back then, right? Because right now, they don't keep your money separately. They keep it all in one big vault. Right, but back then there was, like, it, it wasn't just money backing it up. It was, like, actually money there, right? That is a good point. I don't know. I believe so that for... Because now it's not. No, God, no. Now close. it's only like 10% or something like that that you need to keep. Yeah. 10% Casinos of the money. Casinos don't even need to keep very much on hand. Yeah. I, Which and is, that's just that. I mean, it's, it's just smart, but the interest, it's, also, it's also odd. So, <laughs> um, Enfield has this expression. I know you like the expression oh. queer street. <laughs> and this is where it comes, he says, <laughs> no, it's front street that I like. I, I've never, I haven't heard of queer street Yes, in a you've long totally time. heard of that. So he says um, he doesn't like to ask too many questions because the more it looks like Queer Street, the less I ask. So I guess basically what he's saying is he doesn't want to get involved in other people's shit. He sounds like a delightful man. He is a delightful man. So when he tells this story to Mr. Utterson, Utterson knows that he's talking about Jekyll, but Utterson also knows more than he's letting on. So he just sort of tells Enfield to just drop it and they just kind of let it go. But that's the thing that sort of gets Utterson going. So he goes home and he reviews this will that he wrote for Jekyll. And in the will, it says that if he either dies or disappears, this person named Edward Hyde gets everything he owns. Hmm. So, which is strange. Someone that Jekyll has never known his whole life is now the only beneficiary of his will. Spoiler alert, it's him? (laughs) Yeah, yeah, oh. If you don't know that Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde are the same person, they're the same person. Mm. Yeah. Spoiler alert. <clears throat> in, I like saying it after I spoil in, things. In League of Extraordinary uh, Gentlemen, Mr. Hyde is like 
the Hulk. Yeah, yeah, it's so true, which is not at all like the way he's portrayed in the story. Not even slightly. Uh, Mr. Hyde is short, very short, actually. Oh. Uh, much smaller than Dr. Jekyll is. After you mix a potion. Yeah, he mixes a draft and drinks it. <laughs> so he's now more disturbed about this will than he was before because initially he had even disagreed, he had totally disagreed with the original idea and even refused to do the will. He made someone else do it hmm. because he didn't want to have any part of it. And now that he knows who this Hyde person is, he's even more sketched out because clearly this Hyde person is an asshole. I mean, no one has to pay a hundred pounds in 1800s without being a total asshole. He trampled a little girl, right? And for some reason, <laughs> he's the sole beneficiary of a doctor. This is all really like weird circumstantial story is telling. Here. Yeah, it's like, like why it's oh, because it it's circles like, the drain, man. Because this feels like um, it feels like a Tarantino film, where like you, they show you, all the pieces. You have no fucking idea why you're watching like this thing happen, and then later mm -hmm. on, it ends up being the most important part of the whole movie. Well, that actually is very accurate because the story I think maybe has about seven chapters. And the first five are the continuous story start to finish. And then six and seven are both mm. characters um, telling you what the sort of truth was throughout. Mm. So it is. it does kind of present itself that way. So he was actually practicing to become a linebacker. <laughs> For the Philadelphia Raiders. I wasn't going to get into specifics because I didn't want to upset. <laughs> oh, no, just random. So he goes, so Utterson decides he's going to go seek out a, a mutual friend of his and Jekyll's. This mm. guy named Lanyon. It used to be the three of them. Lanyon? Yeah, you know, the oh. predecessor to Lanyard. Wow. And, <laughs> so Lanyon is also a doctor. There's two doctors and a lawyer. Of course lawyer. he is. Lanyon can be whatever he wants. <laughs> yeah. So Lanyon says that he has barely seen Jekyll in the last 10 years because they had scientific differences mm. and he refers to his sci unscientific balderdash refuse to go down on him and then he says yes and then he says something began to go wrong in his mind in his so bedroom yes you know it's like a fortune cookie something went wrong in his mind in bed <laughs> <laughs> unscientific balderdash I forgot about in bed that. <laughs> So after this conversation, he's getting more and more worried about Jekyll, and he has these terrifying dreams about Hyde, because he still hasn't seen Hyde, so in all of his dreams, it comes to him as this sort of shadowy figure murdering Dr. Jekyll. Mm. So he decides that he's going to go find uh, Hyde. He's just going to go wait for him outside the door until he finds him, which is super creepy and totally out of line for a lawyer to do, but in the 1800s... Don't give a shit. No. Do whatever you want back then. Yeah. Um, and he even says, um, if he be Mr. Hyde, then I be Mr. Seek. Which is, back then was clever. <sighs> but now, because it's been done so many times for so long, it seems dried up and old. But that was the original joke. It was made in the text. Wow. Does he... Does he trust stairs? Who? Because they're always up to something. <laughs> I don't think he trusts stairs. <laughs> he certainly are. <laughs> so waiting outside this door, finally he sees Hyde. So he confronts him. And in a really weird way, because Hyde is trying to get away from him, he asks him if he can look at his face. Because he just he really wants to see his face to to know what he looks like, um, so Hyde lets him see his face and he recognizes okay. that it's him because he knows what the description is like. Mm. So this is how he's described in the book. It, he's described maybe six or seven times and it's all fairly similar. This is the gist of it. Mister Hyde was pale and dwarfish. He gave an impression of deformity without any nameable malformation. So nothing about him was clearly wrong, but clearly something was wrong with him. Everyone has that same idea. Okay. <laughs> You're not understanding, I, I know. I don't it. understand. So no one can pinpoint why he looks wrong, mm. but everyone feels very uncomfortable around him, mm. noticeably and immediately uncomfortable. And this is actually what Utterson says about him. 
If ever I have read Satan's signature upon a face, it is upon that of your new friend Hyde. <laughs> yeah. So no fuck one you. likes him you fuck you? from the second they see him. Nobody gives a shit about your health tweets. <laughs> health tweets. <laughs> <laughs> so Otterson says something to Hyde about having met him before. And Hyde says, or, oh, no, I, I remember what it is. He tells Hyde that Jekyll has described Hyde to him before. Mm. But he knows that's bullshit because Hyde and Jekyll are the same person, right? So Hyde says, calls him a liar and just runs inside the door and slams it on him. So okay. that's, that's the first time Utterson ever meets Hyde is just out in the street. And at this point, he hasn't even seen Dr. Jekyll in the, in the whole course of this story. So he just remains like a, a an idea. Well, no, so far he hasn't seen Jekyll. But like from from the character, like from the like the reader's perspective, like there's no there's no Doctor Jekyll yet. Is Not there? yet. No. He's just spoken of. Exactly. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. So, Utterson then walks from that door around the street up to the front where Jekyll's house is. So Enfield is <laughs> not very bright. Are they connected houses? Yes, it is one house. <laughs> So Enfield even later <laughs> talks about how embarrassed he is that he didn't recognize that that was the same house. Wow. Yeah, it's, just, it's just really a long house. Wow. So that's, that's Jekyll's back door. That's, um... That's like... <laughs> that's like on Bojack Horseman. Princess Caroline is, is dating, uh, like, a kid who is actually two kids stacked on top of each other in a trench coat, and he has, like, a broom for a hand. Oh. <laughs> and so, like, she meets him as a kid and he's like oh i'm the i'm the his son and then <laughs> they, they never see each other in the same room and every time she's like i want to talk to your dad he's like okay one second and he just runs away and comes back in the reminds me of goes. fight club <laughs> where they're just never in the same room one enters the other oh. exits yeah that's a good yeah, movie that's a great film so when Anderson goes up to to meet with Jekyll. He goes into his house and he knows his butler very well. His butler's name is Poole. Okay. Poole with an E. It's not Lanyon? No. Oh. Lanyon's not... Lanyon's a doctor. Why would he be a butler? <laughs> it's not a great career combination. That's what he wants. Yeah, sir, would you like a scalpel? <laughs> um, so he finds out at this point that Hyde has never dined at Jekyll's house. Dined. He has never dined with Jekyll. Dined. So that's actually his first clue. That for some reason, Hyde spends all this time there and all the servants know him, but he's never dined with Jekyll. Mm. So the only reason that really makes sense is that they're the same person. I guess Jekyll could be ashamed of him. It's probably what Utterson assumes. That would not be the first yeah, assumption The only of mine. solution is they're the same person. Because I know people that I've never seen in the same room before. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Well, at this point, Utterson is assuming that Hyde is blackmailing Jekyll. Mm. Because he thinks that it's sort of for either some sort of major shame that Jekyll has or some sort of leverage that Hyde has over him. Okay. And he's just really worried that Hyde is going to kill Jekyll in order to inherit all the money in the will. Because the will still stands, right? If Jekyll dies, Hyde gets everything. Essentially, regardless of how he dies. So, at this point, he wants to dig up Hyde's past, but there isn't much of a past to him. Mm. Um, so, he... He's my favorite character, Utterson. He's such a good dude. Mm. A lot of the other characters have significant shortcomings in their personalities and the way they behave, but Utterson is just such a straightforward guy, and I guess part of that is being a lawyer. Mm. I feel like there's certain um, ideals that come with that. And so he says that he is happy that nothing bad has happened to him in his life to tarnish his professional record. But he says that he has fearful gratitude for the things that he came so close to doing and yet avoided. Meaning? So he's talking about things that could have ruined his life but didn't. Oh. Those moments where you go left instead of right and you're super glad you did. And he's sort of reflecting on that as not everyone's record can be perfect and untarnished, right? Sometimes there are bumps along the road you can't avoid. Right. Um, and people love to talk to Utterson. People love to... He's a lawyer. He doesn't talk very much. So people just love to, to chat at him. Mm. And uh, he said something along the lines of when 
when the um, when the light of heart have taken to the street. So it's sort of like you talk to the lawyer when you want to talk to a real person. The same way when all of your guests leave, you know, when you think of like people throwing a huge party, mm -hmm. when all your guests leave and there's only three people left, those are the ones you have like a good long conversation with because those are like the true friends. Right. Same idea. Utterson's like that guy who sticks around after everyone else to, you know, sip gin by the fire until ah, yes the gin exactly well and they didn't Always have to waste the gin they never had to drive back then so they could be wasted all the time never thick and never thin but always the gin gin <laughs> <laughs> so utterson takes this opportunity where he's sitting late with jekyll to question him about the will and jekyll pretty much just ignores him he tries to move on to other things he even tries to throw shit at lanyon he tries to talk about how lanyon's like basically a piece of shit it's funny they're best friends but they hate each other throughout the whole story <laughs> they're like teenage girls yeah exactly Lanyon and Jekyll just never get along um but he asks Utterson to promise him to protect Hyde which is also a weird sign for Utterson because at this point he still thinks that it's blackmail so it doesn't really make sense why he would want him to take care of him after he's gone this whole story is really just Utterson being confused, start to finish, because he never really <laughs> figures it out until he actually reads Dr. Jekyll's final will and testament in which it tells him what happens. Mm. Right up to that point, he's just awestruck at all these things that are going on. Hmm. So he agrees to do it, but he says, I will not like him. <laughs> Shit, whatever. <laughs> I'm not going to call yeah. him that, I... even if there's a fire. <laughs> not going to do it. Um... So there's actually a chapter that's called Dr. Jekyll was quite at ease. Mm. And I thought, oh, that's really nice. It's not even two pages long. <laughs> <laughs> so it so, goes to show you that that is pretty short lived. He talks about. Sorry, can I just. I just love that uh, your notes on the top, the header yeah. is Dr. J plus Mr. H. <laughs> yeah, every time I think of V Man, Mr. B. Every time that's what comes to my mind. Oh, it's like you could like carve it into a tree. Yeah, Dr. J plus Mr. H forever <laughs> and ever and ever and ever and ever. Uh, so he agrees that he'll do it, and the doctor tells him that Hyde is not his problem. Hyde is something he wants. He says he could be rid of Hyde anytime he wants. That's his claim. So a year passes between then and now. Aggressive. Yes, very aggressive. So a year passes, and then there's a murder. A murder. A murder. Murder, murder, murder. <laughs> so there's a murder of a member of parliament, which no. obviously is a huge deal. Very. So this is what the maid servant saw from her window of the murder. She's both? Maid is a servant? Yeah, she's yes. a servant and a maid. Ah, a yes. maid servant. Yeah. She's made to be a servant. <laughs> oh. So she went upstairs at 11. To watch the city out her window, because that's their TV. To watch... She saw... Their, to watch their city out her window? Yeah, that's their fucking TV, man. <laughs> Get a little candle and, like, watch, you know. Oh, you know, going to spend the rest of the night uh, just watching the city. They do a lot of description of the fog. As far as I understand, London had some really aggressive fogs back in the day. And in 1950, they even had a fog that killed something like 12,000 people. What? But regardless, they talk about the fog a lot, and it's really cool descriptive what? imagery. So if you want, you should read it. It's good. Uh, so she went upstairs at 11 to sit and watch the city, and she sees a silver-haired man who is the member of parliament. And as he's walking, Hyde is walking the other way, and they sort of meet each other in the street. And the member of parliament tries to be polite to him. He tries to, to say some sort of general things and just be nice. And Hyde is so impatient and just upset that he just strikes the man, starts trampling on him, and then beats him with savage fury. Oh, wow. The description of it is bones audibly shattered and the body jumped on the roadway. Holy. Yeah, so he viciously murdered him. He broke his wooden cane in half, beating him to death. So, <laughs> yes, the, the maid fainted because she was so shocked by it, didn't wake up for a few hours. Jeez. Yeah, so a significant murder shocks all of London. Everyone knows about it, and so Utterson gets hailed. And he's asked by the police to help out because he... This is sort of like when you watch movies, and um, in, what's that movie called? Um, Law Abiding Citizen. Mm. For some reason, Jamie Foxx is doing all this cop stuff, even though he's a lawyer. 
Yeah. Right? It's it's sort of the same thing. Utterson, just for some reason, is a police officer in this story because it, I don't know, it's convenient. <laughs> so the police are asking him for help, and they go to Hyde's home because Hyde actually has a home somewhere in London. They go there, they find his broken cane, which is actually a gift from Jekyll. Almost nice. everything he owns is a gift from Jekyll. Mm. I wonder why. Hmm. And they identify who the body is, so they've confirmed that. Um, and then, then they go and find out that Hyde is Hyde has disappeared, but it doesn't make sense that he's disappeared because he never went anywhere. He went to his home, and then that was it. No one ever saw Hyde again once he entered the home. No one saw him leave. Hmm. And they even say that he is the heir to um, Dr. Jekyll's 250,000 pounds. That's how much money he had back hmm. then. Yeah, so Dr. Jekyll is loaded. And that's part of why Utterson was so worried, because it would make sense for someone to want to steal that much money. Mm -hmm. It would really be worth inheriting. So when, when they're at his house, they find out that he came very late, and then, oh, sorry, I lied. He left his house shortly after. <laughs> totally <laughs> lied. But she says that that's not unusual because Hyde is super irregular. He never shows up on a normal schedule. And the last time she saw him was two months ago. So Ooh. she's basically completely useless. His house was more or less ransacked. And anything that they could find was burned. So Hyde essentially up and vanished. Mm. Gone into thin air. So Utterson then goes to visit Jekyll, because obviously Jekyll is still at the center of all of this. And he's actually going there to warn him so that Jekyll doesn't get pulled into the murder investigation, right? Murder, As murder. He, he's a known associate of Hyde. So back in the day, when they didn't have maybe the most uh, rigorous court system, you could really easily get sort of lumped in and take the blame because the guilty party disappeared. Mm. So he goes to tell him, and... Uh, Jekyll is certain that Hyde will not be caught. Absolutely certain that it will not happen. Hmm. And Utterson tries not to question this too much because he's hoping that Jekyll is not hiding him. Uh, hiding Hyde! Uh, oh, oh. Hidey Hyde! So Jekyll claims that a note was hand-delivered by, by someone on behalf of Hyde. And he gives it to, um, to Utterson to read. So Utterson reads this note and... It's, it's a totally normal note, but then when he goes to leave, he asks the butler uh, who delivered it. And the butler says, no mail came today at all. So mm -hmm. apparently a letter was hand-delivered to his house, and yet his main servant who answers the door was unaware of it. So he hand-delivered it to himself because he wrote it. He just wrote it, yeah, and then just gave it to Utterson. It was probably written in the same office. It was never delivered at all. Hmm. He wrote it as Hyde and then switched back to Jekyll. Weird. Yeah. And that's part of trying to throw everyone off his scent. Why would he have a letter from Hyde? Mm. Right? It, 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 it sort of adds up. But the lawyer is a lot smarter than the doctor in this one. <laughs> <laughs> so Utterson then goes home to talk to his lead clerk, whose name is Mr. Guest. I don't know why. Okay. I don't... It's just... I don't know where he gets all these names. They feel very authentic. I feel like Guest might have been a name of the era, hmm. but I'm not certain. So Mr. Guest is a student of handwriting. Again, because they don't have television. This, kid, this guy's way too cool. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Dude. I study handwriting. You know, printing wasn't cool enough for me, so I, um, I like to cursive. Well, they do say that that is a window to the soul. Cursive? Yeah, no. But they say you can tell a lot about people from their signature. They do say. I know. I always see those things, and it's yeah, like, also... the way you cross here shows that you're independent and strong. Shut the fuck up. It shows I like to do my F right through the other letter. I've seen people hold pens in every possible way, and I think that has something to do with how their writing comes out. Yeah, no, that's a very good point. Like, I have a weird fucking bump. It seems like you're very uh, self-confident in yourself. Uh, no, I broke my finger last year, and I have to hold the pen like that now. Like, I held a pen as a child, and it shaped my finger. Yeah, I've got a bit of that, a callus from uh, from holding the... I don't think it's a callus. Oh, you think it's actually like a dent in your bone? Feel it. Feel the difference between my middle fingers. 
Oh, I can see the you difference. Can see it. Yeah. Hold the pen crazy. too often, man. Yeah. So, but when, it, no, it's got to be my YouTube interest. That's what helps my fucking tease on my Mitch. Like, yeah. <laughs> okay. So he shows this this note to Mister Guest, and says, uh, "Like, what do you what do you make of this the <clears throat> note that Hyde gave to Jekyll, supposedly?" So Guest looks at it, and it's nothing special. But at the same time, a dinner invitation arrives from Doctor Jekyll, and so Guest says, "Could I see that? I'd like to compare it." Guest. So they he puts them side by side, and he realizes that the signature for Hyde is identical to the signature for Jekyll. It's just sloped differently. No. So Jack, so that's all he does is just turn the slope of his handwriting. That's how he hides himself. What, what, uh, that's like Superman uh, taking the glasses off. <laughs> what he should do is use his left hand. Yeah, but then it would be totally illegible. I would love, yeah. I mean, it would be a square if I... <laughs> nah, not working. So he... He wonders whether Jekyll has forged the hand of Hyde or if there's some other foul play going on. Because the thing that makes the most sense is that Jekyll wrote the note on behalf of Hyde. The foulest of play. The fa- foul play. He then goes to the, the party that Jekyll just invited him to. And for two months, Jekyll returns to good health. And everything is normal. The, whole, the three of them are back together. Lanyon and Jekyll are friends again. Everything is good. And then obviously it's not anymore. So <laughs> the fucking pause. <laughs> so suddenly the pause on that sentence. Is really funny to me. <laughs> suddenly Jekyll is confined to his house and doesn't see any guests, so, including Mister Guest. Well, yeah, probably not Mister Guest. <laughs> <laughs> my guest, guest, guest. You cannot be my guest today. <laughs> I guess tomorrow you can come back. Be my guest then, guest. <laughs> Guest. Be a so, guest, Mr. Guest, <laughs> with all the rest. <laughs> I'm really glad you quoted that song. You know what that's from? It's from um, Be Our Guest. Beauty and the Beast. Beauty and the Beast. Oh, that's a boy. I like Beauty that. Beauty and the Beast. <laughs> yes. A similar story about a man who is cursed with becoming a beast and falls in love and is in no, in no way connected to this. Story. Yeah. <laughs> Not at all. <laughs> so, Utterson tries to visit Jekyll for, I think, six consecutive days before he starts to get worried. And he goes to see Lanyon, to see what's up. So, when he visits Lanyon, Lanyon is extremely sickly and on, his, on death's door, essentially. And he says it's the result of a shock. He, he even says, this is how checked out Lanyon is on life. He says, I liked life. Yes, sir, I used to like it. So not only has is he about to die, he doesn't want to live anymore. Mm. And so Otterson then mails Jekyll because he doesn't know how else to get to him. He can't right. he won't be permitted to his home and Jekyll won't see him in any other way. Jekyll responds by essentially saying, Please just leave it. Leave me be. Which is obviously not a satisfactory answer. A week later, Lanyon is completely bedridden, and three weeks later, he's dead. So Lanyon dies, and a letter is sent to Utterson, and it says, Private for J.G. Utterson. Which I like saying his name that way. J.G. Utterson. <laughs> yeah, because it sounds like a first name, J.G. No, J.G. Utterson sounds like a porn star name. A little bit, yeah. J.G. Utterson. It sounds J.G. Like, Crystal Utterson. It sounds like... If you were to make up a porn star name for the 1800s in a porno set in the 1800s, parodied in The Simpsons. Mm. (laughs) J.G. Otterson. Nice. And Casey McBoobs. (laughs) Boobington. That's it. No, that's right. So the private letter for him says, Private for him in the case of his predecease to be destroyed on red. So, only for Utterson to be destroyed if he dies. Burn after eating. So then Utterson opens it, and within it is another sealed letter. And it says, open at the death or disappearance of Dr. Jekyll. Now, what's really interesting is that both the will and this letter say death or disappearance. Every time it says it in those terms. It's not just death. Mm. They always include those words, disappearance. Weird. Well, it's not weird when you know the reason. Because he wouldn't die if he simply turned into Hyde and became Hyde forever. Hmm. Jekyll, there's no body. 
he wouldn't be deceased. He would be missing. Right. So that's why it's included because he may just one day never come home. Jekyll may just never be again. So why does why is he continuing with this whole Mr. Hyde thing? You will find out. We're getting there. We're getting there. It's the weirdness. linebacker thing, isn't it? I don't know what that <laughs> means. I was joking the first time. <laughs> he turns into like a big heavy man so he can like throw people around. Oh, okay, so that he can play linebacker for the yeah. Raiders. Ah, I see. Yes. <laughs> it wasn't Fran, it was Hyde who could play linebacker for the Raiders. <laughs> oh, Hyde would be a great linebacker. So, at this point... Mr. Jekyll's legs are being digested. <laughs> he somewhat gives up on Jekyll at this point because he doesn't know what to do anymore. Mm. And then he's out on another one of his walks with Mr. Enfield when they come by that door. And the door is next to this little courtyard that has a few of Dr. Jekyll's windows overlooking it. So they decide that they're just going to kind of go buzz him. So they walk into the courtyard to see if they can see him, and he's actually sitting at his window. Mm. And so he greets them, honestly, pretty well enough, and they talk for a while. But then when they've even just literally in words agreed that they are going to sit and speak at the window, like he says, yes, I will sit and speak with you a while. I think at that moment, he just suddenly goes pale and sickly and looks terrified and then just slams the window shut closes the blinds and, mm. and they don't see him anymore. He's lost control. And the other guys don't even know what to do because they're actually so off-put by his look, his look of terror. Hmm. They just walk away in silence until they're, uh, you know, on a different street, and then finally they essentially decide to move on. Same way they did the first time. Every time they go by that door, they just decide not to talk about it, so they probably just should walk through a different street, just, just go around yeah. the door. I don't think I've ever really heard the like the real version of this story. This sounds nothing like anything no, I've ever heard. Not even remotely similar. And it, it's it's really weird the the distortions in Hyde because Hyde is described as being small, brutish, and hairy, but in every single version of the movies, he's always massive, way bigger than Doctor Jekyll. Hmm. Right in in League it's like of Extraordinary, Frankenstein, right? Like the green thing, right? Exactly, the green, the neck bolts, the electricity. There's just so many things it's that it's alive. Was that, that was in the book, wasn't it? That was not in the book. No, no. Which is stupid because I even remember you pointing out that it's written in a quote on the book cover. It's but alive? it's not in the book. Yeah. Wow. Someone quoted like it's alive, and then they wrote the rest of the review, and that was put on the, the cover, uh... but that's not even in there. It's still better, though, than a quote from a journalist that is one word. Yeah, fantastic. Magnificent. Not magnificent. Yeah. Excellent. It's like, the, how can a journalist speak without context? How can you quote a single word from someone? If you said thumbs up. That's two words. But that would be, that's what they're saying. When they say magnificent, they're saying thumbs up. That's it was the good. thing, though. Thumbs up in itself is a statement. Magnificent is just a word. It, it, it could be magnificent in its departure from the original content, is what mm -hmm. it could say. It's true. It's true. You Delightful can't. to read because if, it is so poorly written. If they wrote one word, you can quote one word. Right. But you can't just grab a one word bite out of it. But even then, a quote of one word is barely a quote. Yeah, it it's is. It's like barely even the definition of what... Well, requ unless, unless this was your opening line. The only way I can describe Avengers Affinity War is one word. Fantastic. But even then, why would you write that? Why would you use all that preface? Why wouldn't you just say it was fantastic and move on with your thing? The reality is use more than one word. Don't yell at them. Hey, this is a PSA. They're supposed to be loud so people get the point, you know? Yeah. And also, if I shout, it might go from their earphones to the person next to them. Mm. And they might hear me. And then we could, yeah, tell the person next to you. Yeah, n just tap them. Tap them, turn to them, and tell them. Okay, hey, uh, we'll wait. Uh, Bruce played on YouTube. Yeah, just say that. <laughs> hey, uh, Super Nicole on YouTube. Try it. Don't actually tell them that. You should do it. Uh, use your own discretion in this circumstance. We are in no way uh, expecting you to speak to other people. Do what you like. In fact, if you're probably if you're listening to a podcast in public, you're probably doing it because you don't want to talk, talk to other to people. Talk to people, yeah. So maybe just keep it to yourself. You could just write it on your hand and show it to people. <laughs> That's way worse. That is way weirder, talking. right? <laughs> Check out this YouTube channel. And the guy sitting next to you, you just hold your arm up. And... <laughs> it feels like you're in like danger. Yeah. Help you, me. He's super help? not cool. Do you need help? 
Is Super Nut cool? Are they kidnapping (laughs) you or something? (laughs) So after this weird encounter with... In no way um, uh, recommend uh, YouTubers kidnapping people. Yes. No. Or YouTubers being kidnapped. No, no. Or just kidnapping in general. Yeah, no, bad. Bad. Bad thing. Uh, Like Dr. Jekyll. Dr. Jekyll bad. Yeah. (laughs) Mr. Hyde bad. So after this weird encounter with Jekyll, Utterson is called to the house uh, by Poole. When he gets there... These fucking names feel like they're about to set up an Advent and Costello routine. Yeah. Fucking Utterson got pulled in by Poole, who was then next so to So Utterson read the letter, see? <laughs> Utterson read the letter, and the letter was from Poole. So he went over to Poole, but he got wet when he got there. <laughs> and wet was his wife. I mean, she wasn't wet, but her name was wet. <laughs> so he gets to Jekyll's house, and all of Jekyll's servants are gathered around the front fire, and they're terrified. Mm. The first thing that Utterson sort of thinks is he's mad at all of these servants because they're they're supposed to be doing their jobs. Why mm. are they all why aren't they doing anything? Why are they all here? And then he starts to realize that something is like really not right. So he's told by Poole that something is clearly wrong with Jekyll and that he's gonna show him. So Poole goes to take him back to where Jekyll is near that back door. And this is what Poole says to him. Just to fucking unnerve him right before they go and talk to him. He says to him very clearly before they walk up to the door. You come as gently as you can. I want you to hear and I don't want you to be heard. And see here, sir, if by any chance he asks you to go in, don't go. Yeah. What? Exactly. So he's he's telling him everything will, like, regardless of what you think, you're wrong. Like, we're just here so that you can hear his voice. And so he knocks and he says, Utterson's here for you. And the voice replies, like, I'm not going to see him. And he says, perfect. And they just they just bolt away. But when they get back, he says, what did you hear? And Utterson says, that wasn't Jekyll. Like, it clearly was not Jekyll, whoever it was. Hmm. So then they start, you know, figuring out what's going on. What has the past been like? So for eight days, there have been no direct orders from Dr. Jekyll. The only thing they've got is pieces of paper he leaves on his steps for them to go and do. So that's over a week. That's a long time for him to be cooped up in a room, right? Yeah. And he keeps wanting an ingredient and he sends pool out all over the city looking for it. Different chemists, different suppliers trying to find this special ingredient. And that's what he devotes these eight days to. The perfect key lime pie. One last pie before I die. (laughs) So Poole describes that he saw a short, masked man who fled from him into the study. And he says, he says, I don't know what it was, but I know for a fact it was not Dr. Jekyll. I have Mm. seen where he comes to in the door. And this person was substantially shorter. Yeah, I'm measuring my friends next to door door spaces. He's taken care of uh, Jekyll since he was a child. So he's been with Jekyll for like 30 or 40 years. Mr. Utterson? Poole. Oh, Poole says, sorry. You're talking about a different person. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Sorry. So Poole says, I know where he comes to in the door. It was not him. It, he was too short. Mm. So he believes that it's Hyde in there. And that's what he tells him. He says, I'm pretty certain that Hyde is behind that door. And at this point, they probably assume Dr. Jekyll is in there murdered. Oh, well, that makes the most sense. He's not anywhere else because he would have come back to his house after eight days. Mm. He didn't just go to Spain or something and forget to tell everyone. Maybe he did. He's fucking weirdo. So they agree they're going to break down the door because at this point, they just want to know the truth. So they discuss what they're going to do and they get... I think Jekyll has his own, like, enforcer. Because they get this guy whose name oh. is Bradshaw, and he comes with, like, a stick. And even Bradshaw. This, this is my best, sorry, this is my favorite line in this whole story. This is the <laughs> funniest thing. He says, he says, okay, okay, in order to prevent escape, you guys go around the corner with a pair of good sticks. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't even call them clubs. Good sticks. Yeah, just use a pair of good sticks oh. and go block the exit. So here's your, this here's your whip ass stick. So he, so uh, sorry, he, I keep using too many pronouns. 
Utterson and Poole are at the door, and they're waiting for the people to get in position around back. And Poole tells him that he's actually heard the whoever the creature is inside the room weeping in the night. Mm. And it's unusual because every other sound they hear is aggressive. So it's unusual that they would hear sobbing hmm. from a creature of anger. So they break down the door. They give him fair warning. They hear Hyde's voice. So they go and smash the door in. And when they get inside, they find Hyde lying on the ground and he's dead by suicide. Whoa. Yeah, he's taken cyanide and is dying on the ground as they enter the room. So Hyde exits the story right then and there. Hmm. They search the entire laboratory and find nothing. No body. The only thing they find is a broken key. So it doesn't give them any clues to go off of. So at this point, they're still looking for Jekyll. They assume that Jekyll is still missing. Yeah. So they find Jekyll's prize notebook where he writes about all of his scientific discoveries. And they find these obscenities written all over it in the margins, in his own handwriting. Just things like, yeah. Table. (laughs) Why did you leave the keys on the table? You're going to create another table. (laughs) J.G. Booberson. (laughs) Just written in there. It's a bunch of Marilyn Manson quotes and shit. (laughs) They also notice that um, there's... Do you know what a cheval glass is? No. Wow. (laughs) Anyways... Brother doesn't kn- doesn't think that I know what a cheval glass. Of course I know so, what a cheval glass is, brother. It's one of those rotating mirrors. Oh, s- a long mirrors that can be tipped. Oh, really? S- to look down or up. I was thinking one you drink from, but see, I was too, and that's why I was so confused. It said they were looking into the cheval glass, and I was like, what? Like two so, dudes just like staring into a into a glass. Into a yeah. Glass so and... I finally looked it up. So he has this mirror which tilts back and forth. And why do you think he would need that mirror? To see the other version of himself. So he can point it at his tall self or his short self, <gasps> depending on who he is at that particular time. It feels time. like the a, a, a riddle. Like, there's shavings on the floor. Yeah, and, yeah. yeah and like... There's a dead man in a room and a cheval glass pointed <laughs> at the ceiling. <laughs> <laughs> the car, the, the, the car's windows were up and it was a bulletproof car and he's like... So this is where the story starts to layer itself. So they find a letter in the cabinet desk, and it's dated that very day, so it was just written. And it then was a poem. With it says, young man, there's no me to build down. It's like, young man. <laughs> <laughs> it's a young man poem. <laughs> so it, the letter that he gets has two letters inside of it that are also both no. sealed. <laughs> so, okay. No. So, so one of them he opens, and it is a new will. Mm. The will is exactly the same, except for it replaces the name Edward Hyde with Utterson's name. So Jekyll is leaving everything he owns to Utterson. Okay. And the other is a letter entitled Dr. Jekyll's Confession and says to be read after Lanyon's letter. So he knew that a letter was left by Lanyon for Utterson to read. Hmm. So he left his own letter to be read after that letter <laughs> <laughs> to fill Utterson in. That's like a fucking weirdo. I think it's great. So this is where the sort of story within story begins. So this is doc this is what happened to Dr. Lanyon in his whole leading up to death. Hmm. So, Dr. Lanyon was sent a registered letter, and if you don't know what that means, it's a letter uh, where you request that the post office bring back um, confirmation of delivery. Okay. So that way you don't just send the letter out and hope it gets there, you actually know for a fact it arrived. Mm. So he receives a registered letter from Jekyll, which seems unusual because there's no reason to register a letter to a friend of yours. So he reads it, and it says, it has a lot of really expressive language in it, but it says things like, if you fail me tonight, I am lost. And it asks him to postpone all other engagements. Whoa. So it asks, it says, rush to my home, meet with my butler and a locksmith that I've hired, break into my study with the locksmith, and there will be a drawer that I want you to bring to me completely unaltered. Actually, not even bring to him. He says, bring it back to your house. And then at midnight, when no other people are around, 
A man will come to your door. Let him in and give him the drawer. Give him the drawer. So all of this is really fucking weird. And he even says, you will receive your explanation five minutes thereafter. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so this whole thing is just cloak and dagger, right? And he decides that because of the urgency that he will follow the instructions. Because Jekyll is still a friend of his, even if they've fallen out. He wants to do right by him. So he follows the instructions. He goes, meets with Poole, breaks into the cabinet. It took them two hours to break into the cabinet. Mm. Although, it's funny because the first time they broke in with a locksmith, it took them two hours. The second time they broke in with an axe and it took them five swings. <laughs> Probably should have just busted it the first time. Just fucked the locksmith. Should have just broke it door, door down. In uh, Patriot, they need to break into a safe and they just like drop it two stories. <laughs> Well, like, that'll do it. He's like, I guess that there's like a reason why they always do it in the cartoons. I, I guess it works. <laughs> yeah, because imagine taking a huge object and throwing it from two stories onto the well, safe. It's the force of itself. Exactly. Yeah, dropping. Its yeah, dropping a safe on itself. It's gonna. It's gonna get mangled. Yeah. Uh, so he does this. He goes. He gets the drawer. The drawer contains a vial of blood red fluid mm. several powders mm. a journal with entries and some of the entries say double and some one entry says total failure so this is this is i think six or seven entries that have these written next to them out of hundreds of entries oh. in this journal but he's really not supposed to even be looking through the journal he's supposed to just take the drawer so he he packs it all up goes to his house and at midnight, when this man comes to his door, he has a revolver on him because he doesn't know... He still doesn't have any idea what's going on. So for all he knows, this is some sort of elaborate murder plot. Wow. Go get my drawer, and then, like, he just <laughs> whacks him in the head. <laughs> you know? He takes the drawer from him and just hits him with it. Yeah, exactly. That's a, This is what I need it for. So the visitor enters and is noticeably startled by police that he sees behind him when he comes into the house, mm. which is already sketchy. He's a small, disgruntled man wearing massive clothing. Massive clothing? That's a weird way to describe that. Clothing that is way too large for him. Massive clothing. It hangs off of him. So, obviously it's Hyde. So Hyde is <laughs> really agitated and impolite, but Lanyon still brings him into the room, shows him the drawer, and sort of says, Has at, have at it. So he mixes the blood red stuff with a powder it goes from blood red to a normal red and then it goes dark purple before turning blue green so this is quite the chemical reaction Jeez. whatever is going on yeah so he carefully watches all these transformations until it turns blue green and then he knows he's ready to drink the draft so at this point how sorry how did Hyde get back to life well Hyde vanished after the um, murder right I thought you said they found him with cyanide uh, so sorry, right? I guess I did not. Um, let me let me let me clarify. So Dr. Lanyon's narrative I told you was in the leading up to his death. Lanyon died before the end of the story, right? So we're now going back in time. Oh, yeah. So oh, sorry. So we've led up to Hyde's death already. Okay. Now we're going back to the days leading up to Lanyon's I death. I see. I don't think you improperly uh, explained that. I think I wasn't paying attention. Okay, there's a lot of information. Actually, now that you process, think about it, I do remember it. I did tell that, yeah. <laughs> now okay. that we're talking. <laughs> so that's why Hyde's alive, because he's still alive. Um, so once all of these changes happen, he then insults Lanyon for his rejection of um, these sort of... He calls them transcendental me medicine. Yeah, okay, I've heard of that. Which is like, yeah, to transcend. Okay, so that's good. So he insults him, and then he says, do you want to know what all this was about? And Lanyon, being a doctor and being overly curious for his own good, says that he wants to know. And so he drinks the drink in front of him and turns from Hyde into Jekyll, fitting his clothes again. And he's like, do you think I could be a linebacker? And he just says, bitch, and runs away. <laughs> so, so, through Lanyon, a tiny hole. Oh, that'd be so great if Hyde actually turned into a very, very small person. 
Oh, like a like um L- like a like Link like, in the Minish Cap. I was gonna say like John Goodman in the Borrowers, or Honey I Shrunk the Kids. Sure. Yeah. What's his name? The actor, eh? Yeah. Oh, fuck. Um, I'm willing to bet at least half the people watching are really upset. Just no, just thought that the video cut out there. Cut. Yeah, that yeah. was that's I think the longest <laughs> period of uninterrupted silence ever. All oh, the names on the tip of my yeah, tongue. it's it's really right there. Um, mm. uh, Rick Rick Moranis. Rick Moranis. Thank that's you. it. Okay. Yeah. No, all right. All right. Podcast over. We figured it out. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> So Lanyon was actually the first one to know that Jekyll and Hyde were the same. Mm. But he took that secret to his grave. He only wrote it in this letter, and this letter was only supposed to be opened after Dr. Jekyll's death. So he chose not to sell Jekyll out, Mm. even though he knew he was a murderer. Because he knows who Hyde is and what Hyde did. So he knows that that's a significant deal. That's a bad thing to do. It's actually highly immoral now that I think about it that he didn't (laughs) say anything. But whatever. So, now that Utterson's read that, he goes on to read Jekyll's full statement of the case. Mm. So, this is where Jekyll basically lets everyone off the hook and tells them what is going on. Because even at this point, he doesn't really know what's going on. All he knows is that Hyde turned into Jekyll. That's the only piece of information he got. Mm. This, I think, is the most interesting part of the story, is Jekyll's full account. So... He talks about wanting to be an honest man, but having these dark desires. And fortunately, they don't go into any description as to what his uh, obscene desires are. And I'm fortunate for that. I don't want, I didn't want to know. I just wanted to know that they're immoral. They're not good. That's Mm. the idea. So he spent most of his life being good and in some ways being immoral, having these sort of hidden pleasures that he seeks. And he sort of dealt with this throughout his life, and he was okay with it. He came to terms with with the way his dark side fit into his light side. And he, much like Frankenstein, chooses not to share his method of separating Hyde from Jekyll Mm. because he doesn't want other people to fall into the same trap. Right. Which I think is a really cool writing tool because it makes so much sense and is way cooler than describing the process. Describing the process ruins it. It does. It just doesn't hold up. It's like if you, it's like if you um, lengthened the end of Inception by a second. Yeah, it would not make it better, at all. No, it's perfectly timed to be ambiguous. He also says the other reason he doesn't share it is that he doesn't really know how he did it. <laughs> yeah. So it's sort <laughs> of a, yeah, exactly. Um. So. Jekyll purchases a batch of this salt and he uh he uses this salt to create the first draft and when he does it he describes the grinding of bones the nausea horror and he said it was so abrasive to his spirit that it was similar to either birth or death jeez yeah so he says that he was happy at the novelty of being another person But soon that started to turn to joy in doing the heinous acts in the first place. Oh. Because he'd separated his soul into these two pieces, he had Jekyll and Hyde, who is now pure of evil desires. So when he is Hyde, he doesn't even have that little part of his brain feeling bad. Hmm. He just enjoys doing it. Have you seen the Rick and Morty episode where their toxic selves get extracted i have not no so in it i mean i haven't confirmed this myself but there's a theory i guess about so um rick doesn't wear a seatbelt in any episode of the show except the episode where they are um where their toxic parts are taken out because he like with all of that horrible part of him taken out he has something to live for so he puts his seatbelt on for an episode And then takes it back off as soon as his toxic self is back inside his body. Whoa. It's fucked up. That is really fucked up. What's interesting is that that's a little different because Jekyll is not altered by the presence of Hyde. Mm. Jekyll's personality didn't have the evil portion stripped out of it. Was it a new person? Well, what he says is that he is 
So Hyde is this creature of pure evil, but Jekyll is just still Jekyll, the doctor. Mm. Jekyll is not an angel. He wasn't. He didn't separate his soul into two pieces. He merely took an evil piece and made it a separate entity, hmm. which is a big fuck up, as he came to find out. Yeah. So he believes that Hyde is both smaller than him and younger than him because of how much less time he spent on his indulgences versus his good, true acts as a doctor. Hmm. So the idea is that Hyde is smaller from not being exercised. And later he even goes on to say that Hyde grows in stature the more he spends time as him. The more he does things that Hyde enjoys, Whoa. the bigger Hyde gets. Yeah, so Weird. that part is really creepy. It might even be part of why so many stories choose to have Hyde as this massive giant. Because there's some truth to that. If you were Hyde for 100 years, you'd mm. become a massive giant, th th theoretically. Um, well, they don't actually know. Exactly. I mean, there's probably some limits to that. Like, he probably maxes out at Jekyll's size or something. I don't know. But I thought that that piece was really cool. And and Jekyll describes the drinking of the, the draft that turns him into Hyde. He says, it is not divine or diabolical. It is not good or bad. It just is. It's a switch. It just... Mm. He describes it as shaking the doors. So it's... <laughs> It's allowing the other soul to sort of take over in a way. Hmm. It, um, it doesn't make him Hyde. It just changes him. So if okay. he takes it as Hyde, he becomes Jekyll. If he takes it as Jekyll, he becomes Hyde. It's not like he needs the fluid to stay as Hyde. Yeah. Interesting. It's, like a, it's, a, yeah, it's a switch. It's a switch. Interesting. Which is, yeah, very unusual because medicine normally does not work like that at all. Normally you need to keep a level in your system or get up to a certain level for it to be effective. And then it usually drains and disappears. Exactly. It dis decays over time. But this happens once, switches. Which is very is unusual. Sharp, sharp. Yeah, sorry about that, people. I just slapped I don't, I don't think I heard as much as I was yelling. Well, we do. We do a lot of that. Yeah. I like yelling. So he, at this point, decides that he now needs to be serious about being Hyde. Because if he wants to do this, he needs to make sure that Hyde is accepted as as him in a way mm. so he tells all of his servants to obey Hyde and what Hyde is supposed to be about he has the will made in case something goes terribly wrong and he can't become Jekyll again so he started to set himself up for all of these all of these eventualities mm. he's trying to prepare himself and that's why there were so many unusual things that went on and so many things that Utterson was picking up on was because he was trying to prepare a second self in a way Right? And that's why everything seems so unusual. Hmm. Um, and also, when he recoils from the window, when he sees Enfield and Utterson sitting down in the road, it's because he recognized Enfield. He remembers Enfield being there and capturing him that very first story hmm. where he trampled the girl. And I guess that memory just sickens him and he leaves. So... This is where things start to get really unfortunate because one morning he he goes to sleep as Jekyll but wakes up as Hyde. Oh. Yeah, in the morning. So he wakes up and he's confused because he feels like he isn't where he should be, but he knows he's in the right room. It's because <laughs> his body is wrong, not the room. Oh. Yeah. So he actually has to get from his room to his study where his where his drugs are without being seen. And he's going through this huge dilemma where he doesn't know how he's going to um, cross the house. And then he realizes he's not, he's not like naked or anything. He's just Hyde. Hyde is actually a normal sight at this house. So he's like, I just need to be calm and just walk mm. there. If he were to like try and scuttle around the house, people would be like, what the fuck are you doing? <laughs> but he, you know, he, are you giving back to your switch drugs? He came to his senses. Yeah, exactly. He went and got his switch drugs. So... This is when he needs to start doubling his doses because he had a failed attempt where it just did not work for him at all. So at this point, he's had to double his dose in order to still make the draft effective. Hmm. And there was six instances of doubling the amount he had to use. Hmm. So you can only imagine how much drug is in the final draft versus the original draft. Right? Yeah. Six doubles is a huge amount. So... That's part of why he 
is running out of supply as well, is that he has to keep increasing how much he's putting into it. Wow. So he's realizing now that Jekyll is no longer the main entity. Jekyll is starting to become on par with Hyde mm. for being the main holder of the body all of a sudden. And they're fighting. Because he's nourishing Hyde. By indulging all of those things, he's building up Hyde's strength. Hmm. Yeah. So this is where he knows that something needs to be done, so he chooses that he's going to not become Hyde again, to give up Hyde. But he doesn't get rid of the clothes. He doesn't get rid of uh, any of the drugs. He just decides to stop. Mm. He does this for about two months until his guard finally falls. And he, he uses the term, to be tempted was to fall. You know how sometimes when you're drinking and someone offers you pizza, it's like, yep, 100%, I'm going to have it. <laughs> that idea. To be tempted at all was to fall into that temptation. And that's why it was a mistake not destroying the drugs and the home. So he does. He falls back into temptation. He takes the draft. And that is when he's out on the street and meets the member of parliament. Mm. And because Hyde has been caged for two months, ah. it just all comes out of him at the same time. And he even says that no person deserves that sort of unprovoked murder. Right. Because he just, just said something polite to him and then just got beat to death. Jeez. Yeah, so that was the unleashing of Hyde. And that is the reason that Hyde had to go away forever. Because now Hyde is a murderer. And that's why he told Utterson later on, you will never see Hyde again. Because if he turns into him, he'll get arrested and hung. Hmm. So now he has a real incentive not to be Hyde. And he's almost even relieved about this. Because now he has no choice. It's sort of like, um, you know, you can choose to go on a diet. But some people like when they're, um, you know, stuck in a place where meals are made for them. Because you don't get the choice. Right. Meals are just brought to you. Um, and he says that after Hyde committed the murder, he was singing before he changed back into Jekyll. And he even said a pledge to the dead man in the road before he drank the draft. Jeez. So Hyde is just a total, total asshole. Yeah. And this is where Jekyll is now super uncomfortable with Hyde. Before, he actually enjoyed being able to do certain behaviors under the guise of another person. But he's now started to realize that Jekyll or that Hyde is more of a tumor and that Ooh. it's a problem for him. So this is when he starts to become homebound because now he's just sort of fraught with fear. But like I said, he's happy that now he can't be Hyde. He has some sort of external factor forcing him into it. Hmm. At this point, he... He starts to wonder if he can indulge in things as Dr. Jekyll because he sort of is in this swing where he went from this horrible activity to trying to do all the best good he could in the world. But after a while, it started to come back around and he started to feel that itch again. Yeah. And one day, he was simply remarking on how good he was doing at trying to be a good person. And he felt the transition come on and turned into Hyde, sitting in the park. So now he's dressed in clothes that are too big for him, with the face of a known murderer, and he's in the middle of the park, <laughs> in the middle of the day. So he essentially goes screaming off to find some sort of dark hole. But he can't go back to his home, where he used to, because he's a murderer now. Right? He can't go back to get his drugs because if his servants see him, they'll turn him over to the police. Right. So, he sends a letter to Lanyon, telling him to go and get a drawer from his house. And he sends a letter to Poole, telling him to let Lanyon in and to take the drawer. And then he goes to meet Lanyon at his house, where Lanyon has conveniently brought him all of his drugs. Huh. So then he goes and converts himself in front of Lanyon. And uh, I, I really do think that the moments leading up to that are, are, are uh, some of the most indicative of Hyde. He takes a cab into the city, 
but he wants to not be too traceable, so he leaves the cab and starts walking around so that the cabbie doesn't get wise. And a woman tries to sell him lights, which I'm pretty sure means cigarettes. <laughs> and so <laughs> he smote her in the face. What? And she ran away. Smote? Yeah, he smote her in what the face. He probably smacked her. Wow. So a woman came up to him, asked him if he wanted to buy cigarettes, and he just hit her in the face, and she went running away. Wow, he's a problem solver. Yeah. <laughs> So, at this point, Hyde is sort of falling apart because he doesn't even know if he's going to get his drugs. He doesn't know what is going to happen next. And for now, he's just a murder suspect. Nothing hmm. else. See, before he was hidden in the body of a doctor, but now he's just a murderer. Right. And he's freaking out for it. So, he finally returns to his form. And at this point, the change is starting to happen all the time. It's more frequent. And it's less intense. It's like he doesn't even notice it sometimes when he slips back into being Hyde. Huh. Yeah. And at this point, because Jekyll is starting to become more sickly, Hyde is growing in strength. And he becomes Hyde any time he closes his eyes. Oh. Any sleep of any sort, Whoa. and he will turn into Hyde. Only at this point, it is now the drug is working the way a normal drug does, where he will be Jekyll, if the drug is in his system, but as soon as it runs out, he turns back into Hyde. Whoa. So the only way he can stay himself is by actively taking the drug, which, like I said, he's been doubling his dosage all along. So he's c very quickly running out of it. Uh. So now he's sending to get more ingredients because he needs more of his drugs. But the problem is that every time he brings back a new batch, every single one of them fails. And he starts to find out that it was not the salt itself that created the drug. It was some unknown impurity in the original batch of salt <sighs> that created the effect. So there's actually no way to know what it was that created the draft. <laughs> so he's lost, and that's why he sends Poole out to get this salt from everywhere he can find, mm. trying to find the right batch, but none exist because it was a bad batch the first time. Mm. At this point, Hyde is essentially taken over once the the drugs really run out they're getting on to their their very last days and Hyde at this point is basically just trying to screw with Jekyll so he's starting to write blasphemies into his book he's starting he burned the portrait of his father he burned <laughs> Jekyll's father's portrait wow yeah he did all these just very silly things he's even described as being apish mm. in these in these moments so he's I'm getting the I'm I'm picking up on the tiny details that were completely overblown in all of the other versions of this story. Yes. Oh, he's apish. Oh, well, let's make him a fucking Hulk. Yeah. That Hugh Hugh Jackman. Yeah. Yeah, Hugh Jackman does fight him as a giant hide in the beginning of Van Helsing. Yeah, he does. Yeah, yeah it's so true. He does fight him, and he's giant, and it's just yeah, it just makes no sense. It just really does make no sense. So really, Hyde is uh, Hyde's just an extremely aggressive, id-thinking creature. A, yeah, id is a very good way to describe him. And it even talks about how Dr. Jekyll pities Hyde. He describes him as not only being hellishly evil, but as being inorganic. <laughs> That's how he describes him. <laughs> That's brutal. Inorganic. Inorganic. That's he, like uh, Shakespeare's list of like old insults. Yeah. It's just like, your inorganic canker blossom. Thou art inorganic. He even wonders if all of this would have been worse if not for the murder of the member of parliament. Because if not for that murder, he would have gone on far longer mm. doing the things that Hyde does and may have actually become Hyde. And Hyde may have inherited all of Mm. Jekyll's things, right? So it could have maybe even been worse if not for that murder. Mm -hmm. And then he says that he hopes that the letter he's writing at this very moment, because Utterson is reading this, he hopes that it is not destroyed by Hyde because Hyde is doing all these horrible things and breaking everything that Jekyll loves and wants. So it would make sense that he'd destroy this letter as well. But he says that he's writing this on the last effect of the drugs, and that as soon as he's done writing this letter, Dr. Jekyll will die and be no more. Hmm. 
because he will become Hyde. And he even talks about how he believes that he says he wonders if Hyde will be strong enough to take his life when the time comes. And then the last thing he says in his full te- in his full statement is, as I lay down the pen and proceed to seal up my confession, I bring the life of that unhappy Dr. Jekyll to an end. Wow. So he ends his own life with a stroke of the pen rather than drinking the cyanide. Sorry, he, what? He himself could have taken the cyanide and died, right? right? Killed Hyde along with him. But he chose to die by waiting for Hyde to come back and then allowing Hyde to oh. kill himself. So I wonder if that speaks to his cowardice or if it speaks to his desire to live. I think that's the an issue with um, the way that people choose to interpret things is that they, they take whatever they liked about it this, this, and they blow it out of proportion. This story isn't triumphant or heroic or even positive. It's about a man creating an additional personality in his body, creating only destruction and then killing himself. Yeah, it's uh, he's. I don't even think he's an anti-hero. He's not a hero at no, all. He doesn't save anyone. Yeah, he doesn't help anybody. He doesn't even help himself. I just really like how clever the story is the way everything comes together the things make sense in this version mm-hmm. the the dr jekyll and mr hyde story where hyde becomes this big raging monster has this sort of illusion that there's control over hyde right in league of extraordinary gentlemen he like performs tasks for them and he talks to jekyll in the mirror yeah none of that makes any sense Talking to the mirror would be a cool. Actually, is actually kind of a cool idea. It would be a good that that would be a good plot point, because he can talk to himself in right. his head. So that yes, definitely makes sense and would be really sick in a movie to show him in front of the mirror, talking to the cheval glass, and they so. I they, think, doesn't he break the glass and then he's like in parts of the shattered pieces in one of them? Yeah. 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 That's sick. In, yeah, actually, you know what? In the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen one, that was really sick. I do remember that. But it would be cool if it showed the cheval glass from above his right shoulder, ah. and it was slightly tipped back to show a little bit of the roof. And then when it showed it over his left shoulder, it was just slightly tipped down to show a bit of the floor. So, so it's the same actor, but it's very clearly Hyde and Jack. And he's actually moving back and forth to speak. Ooh, I like that. I think that. it would be it really, really cool. creepy, too. Yeah, yeah, I think it would be really cool. It's like that Pixar short film with that guy playing chess against himself. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah, very much like all the other stories, I feel like this the story itself is so much better than any retelling of it. Yeah. Just, it really is. And When was it written? Uh, it's... That's a good question. I think it was... I thought it was written in the 1800s. Who is it by? Uh, Robert Louis Stevenson. Hmm. Uh, I don't really know what else he writes. I know he's written a lot of things. Um, There's a lot of other short stories in this book that I'm writing as well. Um, 56? 56, maybe? 1856? Uh, 1956. Oh. Actually, I don't know. When was this written? Here. Here we go. What? What? Where is it? Okay. 1886 he wrote this. Hmm. Man. I like that his How take... How close is that to the Civil War? 1886? That's very close. It's very close because I think it ended in maybe 67 or something like that. Oh, really? Yeah. So, well, I mean, close. I thought it was in the today. 80s. Never mind. Um, it might have been. 67 maybe was a start. I, I'm, I'm rust, very rusty on that. Um... My favorite part of the physical world is the cheval glass. Mm. I really like the symbolism of it because he purchased it after he started becoming Hyde. And there's a lot of speculation about it in the story. Like People notice it when they enter the room and Utterson and the, the butler, they're standing in front of the cheval glass, which is pointed straight at the ceiling because Hyde was probably pissed off and just knocked it or something. And they both look down into it, and they have the same question. What what could he have needed this for? Mm. And I think that it's just super cool how simple the idea is. You don't need to have an alter ego that's shorter than you to buy a cheval glass, right? <laughs> it's for anybody. But it's just so perfect.
perfect the way that set piece fits into the story. Yeah. Yeah, it's a really smart device. I like that. And that's what I really like about the story. There's so many good devices in it. And I like that things are simple. She showed up, she offered him cigarettes, he smote her in the face, <laughs> and she left. <laughs> it's, like an, it's like an elevator pitch of a fantastic story. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, I would call it a novel still. 70 pages. I mean, you could call it a short story, but I would still sort of consider it I a novel. I think I could write a 70-page novel. Well, I'd like to. I'd like you to. I do. Don't want to do. Yeah, that. you don't want to do that at all. Eh? I haven't even much written editing. seventy pages of Mitch show of all the failures. Well, maybe you write it in like twenty eighty eight. You know, twenty eighty eight. Yeah, you'll be around then. I'll be. I'll be a hundred. No, I'll be ninety. Yeah, you'll be old, but like eek, you'll be surviving. Because right now, I guess twenty eighty eight's version of ninety will be a very different exactly, uh, experience. Exactly. Right? Exactly. Well, you know, you know what's really weird is that we're about to live through the twenties again. You okay. don't think that they were, they were roaring the, the last time it happened? So. Well, I they're gonna roar this time one way or the other. It's just a matter of what we're gonna be roaring. People love to shout these days. Oh, okay. I thought it was like ex- existential dread or something. <laughs> uh, it is in a way. <laughs> if you've watched Black Mirror. Oh, interesting. There's lots of existential dread to be had in that show, but all the social media ones are the ones that really get in my head. Uh. Yeah. Well, thank you for joining us in this discussion of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. I hope you appreciated it. I hope they make another movie that is accurate to the book. It would be a long time. Leo yeah. would probably play him. Leo! Actually, Leo could do it. Yeah. Who would play Hyde? Joe Pesci? No, he's too old. No, Leo. How would he play Hyde? He's supposed to be smaller. Is he? But is he described as a, as a different face? Totally different. Oh, yeah. Not Joe Pesci. Well, but but I like Joe Pesci. I just don't think that. But he if, would if be... Joe Pesci and Robert De Niro were both young, oh, that would work perfectly. Oh, a jo- yes. That's what I mean. Is that Joe Pesci just isn't a match for Leo? For exactly. Leo. Exactly. It would have to be like Joseph Gordon-Levitt. Mm, he would play better Jekyll. Or... He would be a great Jekyll, actually. Or. Um, Kaylee Kawakaku. Kaylee Kawakwa? <laughs> she, she could be the maidservant that faints. <laughs> maidservant. <laughs> uh, yeah. maybe, maybe Leo could play Utterson. And oh, then, yes. And then you could have Joseph Gordon-Levitt's play Jekyll, because mm. he'd be fantastic at that. And then... Um, Jack Black plays Hyde. Actually, you know who might work? Jonah Hill. Maybe because he's trying to he's 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 been doing serious stuff. But what about the guy that plays Rorschach from Watchmen? Mm. If you mm. yeah he would yeah that would be a good combination. Perfect. Yeah, and I feel like he's maybe just a little shorter than uh, Joseph Gordon, and then oh, you use some movie magic to the, get him. Oh. The guy who plays Batiatis would have to be Pools. Oh, he'd play a good pool. Yeah, yeah he'd play a pretty good pool. And then, you know, you just pick someone to play Lanyon and die. That's not a big deal. Um, Who's really good at pretending they're on their deathbed? Because that's kind of Lanyon's whole role. Oh, interesting. And they need to be, like, they need to reject a lot of scientific blasphemy. They Sean have to be... Bean, always dying in his films. Oh, he could play a good Lanyon. He yeah. could be deathly ill. I can yeah. see that. He could be bedridden and die. <laughs> <laughs> Are you interested in that, Sean? <laughs> hey, Sean, we have another one where you die? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Early on. Well, I mean, middle. <laughs> you know you know the um, Michael Caine's, like, like, how he picks a film? No. He's like, I'll read the first page of the of the script. I'll read the last page of the script. And if the character I'm playing is on both, I'll do the bloody film. <laughs> Sean Bean's just like... <laughs> I'll take out the, the script. I'll find the spot where I die. <laughs> and then I'll work backwards and decide if I like it. Oh, my God. So, yeah, a movie needs to come out. Uh, so someone put some money out and, mm. and do it. That'll be good. They're constantly rebooting things. So Yeah, it's only a matter of time. Eventually. Well, until next time, I hope you all enjoyed. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, bye. <laughs>